In this video, we'll cover USMLE step three. Um, after recently sitting for step three, personally, some things that I think are worth going over and worth knowing if you're planning on taking step three anytime in the near future. So right off the bat, just some important things to know. I know for me, some of these things confused me when I was first looking up the test. Everything is connected to the test through the FSMB website, not the NBME website. Everything you're doing regarding step three is pretty much on this website. So don't be confused when you search and you find this website come up when you're searching to register for your test. This is actually the website with the screenshot here of what the website actually looks like. I know most of us are accustomed to the NBME website. It is also a two-day exam. So there's day one and day two, which we'll talk about the differences between the two days. And there's also something that's unique to this test, which are the CCS or um, clinical case simulation cases. Um, so these cases are designed to be a way for you to practice clinical skills, but still be sitting at a computer screen. So we'll talk about those as well. So these are just some important things to touch on. Um, so here's some valuable resources. I'll talk about these four. Um, so UWorld, as we all know, has been the gold standard for step one and step two. Um, and it also had they also have a step three Q bank. They have two full-length self-assessments that are four blocks each. They also have a um, CCS portion that practice on their website. And they also have a biostats rapid review section on their website as well. Um, Amboss has a library. It has a Q bank, um, but they don't have practice for the CCS cases that I'm aware. And I think most people generally side towards UWorld because they have the biostats review um, and they also have the self-assessments, but I think Amboss is a great resource as well. Anki, as always, is useful. I think particularly on online right now, I think the Dorian deck seems to be the most popular and strongest deck for studying. It's the one I'd recommend. Uh, many of the, the cards can directly show up on the exam. And then ccscases.com, I think, is another highly recommended resource. So one of the weaknesses of the UWorld CCS cases is that there's no individual feedback. So if you do a case and complete it, you can see what you should have done, but you can't see how you scored per se. So you can't see how you would have improved. But ccscases.com, whether or not it's accurate in terms of your scoring on the real thing is hard to say, but you can at least see things after you get your case done, you can see what you missed and what you were expected to have covered and get a rough estimate of a score, which I think that's why ccscases.com is um, highly valuable. Okay, moving on from resources, we'll talk about first the format for each day, and then we'll talk about some content as well. This video is primarily meant to be a generalization to understand the basics of the test and not go into detail about the topics. Um, but I think this would be helpful for anyone looking to take this test in the future. So day one, the format. So it's a seven hours total exam. So this day is most similar to what we've previously done in step one or step two. So in, it's six blocks of 38 or 39 questions. Um, so in total, if you add it up, it's 232 questions. And so if you just do the math, four of those blocks will be 38, and then two of the blocks will be 39 questions. Um, and there's also a five minute tutorial at the beginning. And if you skip this tutorial, you add that five minutes to your total test time. So it gives you extra break time. In addition, you get 45 minutes of total break time on top of this. And so this can be subdivided however you choose between each block. You can use 10 minutes bef before the first one, five minutes after the second one, or you can skip the breaks entirely, or you can use one break of 45 minutes, however you choose. And if you finish any of these blocks early, which some of them you will, especially if you've been practicing with 40 question blocks, then that extra time gets added on to your total break time. So at the end of the day, you may have a lot more break time than you realize if you've used your break sparingly and then gained break time back between each block by finishing early. So let's talk about the content for day one. So the biggest thing that I think gets most people off guard is the basic sciences. So day one, people make the comparison that day one is essentially like step one. So there's a heavy, heavy focus on basic sciences. So here are two, I think, really, really high yield topics to cover if you can before you take the test. And that's pharmacology. So mechanism of action, which Sketchy can come in handy for this. And then microbiology, which also Sketchy can come in handy for. And so specifically unique features of organisms. 
So it's really impossible to go through an entire step one question bank. It's not really realistic for most people for step three. So the best thing I would say is to just keep these things in mind as you're reviewing your QBank and don't think of it as not important because it will show up on the exam. I'd say the next highest yield thing to cover for day one in terms of content are risk factors, specifically number one risk factors. So if you're given any disease, for example, lung cancer, try and be able to name the number one risk factor for most of the popular diseases that are tested. So for lung cancer, it would be smoking, for example. And so if you can keep the number one risk factor in mind, maybe one and two sometimes, you'll be able to rule out all the other answers because you know that there's always one risk factor that trumps the others because half the questions it felt like would be risk factors. Next, um, biostats. So the UWorld QBank, like we talked about, has a biostats rapid review and AMBOSS, the library itself, has a, a little learning card on biostatistics as well. So this is high yield because it's all throughout the test sprinkled. And I put a couple of high yield focuses in here. Study design specifically, so cross-sectional versus cohort, case control, controlled trials, knowing the pros and cons of each of those, I think will go a long way on this exam. And then the other thing that always, always comes up are p-values and confidence intervals. The two overlap and the two are very much intertwined. But if you just know p-values and confidence intervals, you can save yourself from rereading paragraphs so many times just by seeing those. And you can tell that results are significant or not significant. And then the last thing, I think the most intimidating part of day one overall, besides maybe the basic sciences, are the research abstracts. Um, so... If you just think that there's six blocks on day one, you'll basically get one abstract per block. So every block you should be looking for and expecting to have one abstract. And so on the left side of the screen, you'll see an entire research abstract. And on the right, you'll see either two or three questions um, related to that abstract. So I always highly recommend saving these until the end. I think this is a highly recommended strategy. The paragraphs and paragraphs and the abstracts can really, really slow you down if you don't save them till the end. So if you bank up a bunch of extra time throughout the other questions that are quicker and you save yourself five to 10 minutes, you can really spend time diving in deep to the abstract and not have to worry so much about rushing to choose an answer. So I'd say these four points are probably the highest yield things to study for day one. And if you know these four things, I think you cover basically all of what they talk about on day one. So let's talk a little bit more about the abstract. So like I said, it's about one per block on day one. So each one will include two to three questions. So if you think a block is 38 or 39 questions, 36 to 37 of them won't be abstract questions. The remaining two to three will be. So I highly recommend skipping until the end, like we've talked about. And then I also recommend that in the abstract questions, if you start with the abstract, you may just get bogged down too much in unimportant things. It's sort of like the MCAT, some of the longer sections. And so it's sometimes better to just skip to the question and look at what the question is asking. And then if it, the question asks, what is which one of these is significant, you can immediately go to the table and highlight p-values. If it asks which of the following is a flaw in the methods, you can scroll up to the methods section and so on and so forth. So this is the one time I recommend reading the question before skimming. Typically, I like to read the whole question first so you don't anchor yourself into one topic, but I think these abstract questions are a great way to do that, a great place to do that. Um, and then extremely high yield topics for the abstracts. I think I'd study these before anything else, but there's obviously plenty more you need to study as well. Number needed to treat and number needed to harm. Um, we have a specific video we touch on on this channel, but that's always high yield. Wouldn't be shocked if you see at least one of those. All the different types of bias, both selection and information biases and all the different subtypes. Already touched on p-values and confidence intervals. And then power, type one and type two error. I think these are all extremely high yield for the abstracts. So oftentimes in the abstracts, they're not just going to ask you what is the value or what is the significance of this value from the abstract. They'll also get you to touch on individual biostats related questions from the and just use the abstract as just fodder for those type of, types of questions. So it's just an extension of the biostats portion. So moving on to day two now, the format. So day two is longer. It's nine hours total. It's six blocks still, but it's 30 questions each. So each block is considerably shorter which is good and bad. It's good because there's less questions, but it's bad because if you're like me and save a lot of time at the end to go over some questions you wanna cover, 30 questions leaves you less time to bank up to do that. 180 questions total, um, but that's only half of day two because you also have the clinical simulations. So you have 13 of those. About half, six to seven will be 20 minutes. And then the other six to seven will be 10 minute cases. 
And so just like day one, you have a five minute tutorial, but you also have a seven minute CCS tutorial. And like usual, if you skip the tutorial, if you've practiced beforehand, that, that time can be added onto your break time. And on day two, you get 45 minutes of total break time. So keep in mind that this 45 minutes applies to both the blocks and the CCS cases. You don't get two 45 minute break periods. You have to use that over the course of the entire day. So it's 45 minutes for the whole day, just like day one. So keep in mind, day two can feel a lot longer. It's two hours longer in total, but the cases makes it feel quite a bit longer to me than day one. And as far as content, the three biggest things that they cover are the clinical sciences. So this is familiar to most of us because it's most similar to the Q banks that we talk about that most people study. So it'll be clinical based cases, less focused on the basic science, more focused on um, outcomes, testing, management. Um, instead of risk factors on day one, which is what's the number one risk factor for this, on day two, you'll get prognosis. So for the same patient, lung cancer, for example, the risk factor would be smoking, but then they ask which of the following is most related to prognosis. And you could say whatever the case may be, whether that's um, if they say there's lymph node involvement or if there's metastatic disease or if the FEV1 is low, it just, you kind of have to use contextually what they give you in the question. Then there's the CCS cases. So if you practice them beforehand, you'll know that there's a mixture of these acute emergency department cases, and then there's just uncomplicated outpatient follow-up cases. Um, outpatient is just really to, geared towards helping you follow up with patients over time, and the acute cases are just to see how you think in a short period of time in acute situations. Keep in mind that these often end before the time limit, and so don't be intimidated if all of your cases are ending a few minutes early and you're thinking that there's more that you needed to do, a lot of times when you get to the point where you've covered a lot of the material, they generally stop the case and you don't need to go any further. So it'll end a lot of times quite a bit early. And so I, I typically recommend CCS cases over UWorld. I think both are useful. So if you can do both, I would. But the CCS cases give you the explanations and they show you what you did wrong, which I think is really, really valuable. UWorld does have a more in-depth way of, I think, looking at what the NBME is wanting you to have and wanting you to cover. But I think CCS cases and being able to learn from your mistakes and apply them, I think is particularly useful because we all need feedback on how we're doing. Okay, so here's some final recommendations and we can end here. So I review the basic sciences as you complete the step three Q bank. It's really not realistic at all for people to go back and cover a step one Q bank like you world. That's just not realistic and that's not gonna work for most people's schedule. So as you review a question on a disease pathology, a lot of times you world will touch on the pathophysiology, but you may not think it's important and you may skip over it. I highly recommend not glossing over that. I also recommend that if you're, if you have access to the AMBOSS library or any other resource that gives you access to content and you see a disease that you can't remember the basics of how the disease works, look it up as you go through the questions. That way you don't have to go back and do an entire separate Q-Bank. Highly recommend that on day one, you know risk factors for all the major diseases and prognosis on day two for those same diseases. They Risk factors is solely basically on day one and prognosis questions are solely on day two. And then lastly, I'd practice the CCS cases until you're comfortable with these four things. Timing is really important. Um, essential items that you always want to get. And so, for example, um, complete blood count, CBC, CMP, uh, urinalysis, TSH, ESR, those things you're never going to get penalized for. Um, and generally you want to get those things because it's better to not be counted off for it than to by leaving it off. Um, don't forget about counseling, um, whether that's smoking cessation, alcohol cessation, um, contraceptive counseling, whatever counseling is relevant for the demographic, whether it's a um, childbearing age female or an older male that's a smoker or so on and so forth. Just be familiar with counseling. And then lastly, preventive care. Um, is is a minor thing, but if you just keep in mind each demographic, you'll have this set. So if you keep the USPSTF guidelines in your head, and if you know vaccine schedules generally for adults, adolescents, and kids, you can generally get most of these right without having to think. And once you've gone through enough of these, these will kind of just come in, in your head and you can just kind of enter this all at once. Um, I also recommend just for the sake of saving time, trying to enter your orders in in conglomerate, so all at once rather than doing them individually. It'll save you a lot of time, which can sometimes be a stressful um, part of the cases. 
So that's all for this video. Just wanted to cover the basics of step three for anyone who's taking it. So you're familiar with what it looks like, what content you should review and some tips and tricks for how to review. Um, so like and subscribe if you find these videos helpful and we can maybe make more like this in the future.